Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> this is Andre Rivera. Um, so today I'll be talking about something new that I'm working on. The, I guess I will term it the principles of inspiration. This is my sort of, you could say, pre-work, um, pre-process on how I'm going to approach inspiration, where it comes from, how it reveals itself. These are just will be my thoughts, my questions. We might not be able to answer anything today. Who knows? Uh, that's the whole fun part about philosophy, you could say, the wonder. But of course, this, this doesn't mean that we should stop. Um, we, it definitely should entice us to dig further and try to get more rigorous with our thinking and introspection. Um, so let us begin. All right, so inspiration. What is it? What, where is it found? Where are the, the boundaries of inspiration? Is inspiration slash motivation the same? How about inspiration and discipline? Is it, is discipline the maintenance of inspiration or is there more commonalities between the two than we have you know, thought of. Now, if I just take my sort of anthropomorphic position, meaning, you know, my human position of how inspiration occurs and from my own experience, I would say that inspiration is relatively immediate, right? It's immediate if someone, and you hear this with testimonies from others about inspiration, you know, one day, inspiration just sort of struck them and they write pages in a night um, and so this is something that they would call inspired right they were inspired there seems to be an outside coming in right being them now there's other aspects of inspiration like a man giving a speech right uh, you could say uh, Martin Luther King's speech, right? I have a dream. Now this inspired many people. But here's the thing, right? Some some would argue that it's still, the speech still inspires people, yet Martin Luther King Jr. himself is not alive. So it would seem that inspiration doesn't necessarily depend on the, on the individual that gave the inspiration. So then where does inspiration come from? Um, to give a couple more examples, it would be if you're reading like a a novel, right? And it's inspiring. And if I were to ask you, well, exactly where is this inspiration in the novel? You'd say, well, it's in the in the words. And then I would ask you, okay, well, where in the words? Right? And, and suddenly it becomes very hard to pinpoint materially where is inspiration because ultimately the book is no different from any other book. It consists of the same arrangement of paper and molecules and so forth. And so, and you know, every other book has letters and arrangements of letters. So why is it that those specific arrangements of letters gave you inspiration? So maybe we can safely conclude that inspiration can't necessarily be dependent on material. We also find instances of experience where someone said something and it inspired someone, but maybe that individual, it wasn't their intention to inspire. For example, sometimes just doing an action can inspire other people. So there seems to be this, you know, even intention or lack of intention to inspire can take place, right? Uh, for example, if I'm just helping a lady cross the street, someone might see that and be inspired to, you know, realize something that they haven't been doing in their life. So they're like, you know what, I'm going to now take more effort to start helping people when I see them in need of something, right? Um, now, again, from the perspective of the person helping the woman cross the street, 
they were just being themselves. You know, they, their motivation was just to help the lady cross the street. They had, maybe they had no intention of anybody else seeing and inspiring anybody else. So, you know, that's interesting, like intention, you know, unintentional, unintentional inspiration. That it seems like this is kind of gets very murky here. That maybe maybe we don't necessarily control inspiration, and and just to give a couple examples of the reason why we, we probably don't control inspiration itself is because let's take religion for example. A a a woman on the street can be preaching and be very inspired by her new religion. And so she wants to preach her new religion and inspire those around her. Now, if we pay attention to experiences, well, people are not going to be typically as inspired, especially if they have some sort of, you could say, resistance. And so I'm going to be using terms like, just to kind of give a foretelling here, I'm going to be using terms like resistance, susceptibility, reorientation and transformation. And the reason why I provoke this kind of experience is because clearly when a speech is given and intended to inspire, why or not why is not everybody inspired? Why is it a sort of gamble about who will be inspired and who will not be inspired? Now, I've come to the conclusion that it's possible the reason why people don't or why people are not at all inspired and why some resist inspiration is because of exactly that. The people that are easily inspired, you could say they walk around with a sort of susceptibility, right? There's an opening. There's an opening for inspiration in comparison to people that have a resistance, right? A closing off from inspiration. Now, I don't want to make it sound like having a opening, a susceptibility to inspiration is a bad thing. And I don't want to make having a resistance against inspiration as a good or bad thing. My, my process here is to simply observe how inspiration behaves, right? How it, the pattern of inspiration, right? And how it reveals itself. Because my interaction with inspiration and, and my experience with inspiration is this, that not everyone gets inspired by the same things. And if you put everybody in the same room to be inspired by one thing, I guarantee you that not everybody will be inspired. So it seems that to me, there's a correspondence between having an opening for inspiration to come in, for it to exist, to reorientate, reorient and transform the individual. And then there's the opposite where there's the resistance against inspiration to where inspiration cannot enter and then the person stays the same, right? There is no reorientation or transformation. So for me, this, this interaction is the pattern of the pattern of inspiration. Now, we could say that there is this sort of reflective process going on maybe a sort of mirroring where inspiration does not exist unless one is open and then inspiration is, is existed and closed when one is also closed right the inspiration is not there right so you could I mean you see this in in, in many experiences where there are people that debate, you know, why were all these people inspired? I don't see this. It's 
it's you know it's woo woo it's too much woo woo for me you know so i don't know how they they got inspired by this speech because it doesn't make any sense and it's irrational it's um you know it's just moronic but but you see how it's just focusing on the pattern of inspiration how it reveals and conceals itself has to do almost with the correspondence in which the individual you could say prepares himself if you're preparing to resist a speech then inspiration cannot be struck if you're preparing to be open then inspiration can come in but let's pay attention to when inspiration does come in and what we notice immediately is that there is a reorientation Maybe the individual did not think of something before and suddenly the inspiration has entered and now it has reoriented their entire view, perspective, you could say even actions, motives. And so now it has, in fact, created a reorientation and then proceeds with a transformation, right? So this reorientation, then transformation into which the, the individual pursues, right? So in fact, inspiration gives a gives a sense of direction into which now the individual proceeds to transform themselves towards gratifying that direction. Okay. So now we have the sort of pattern in which inspiration kind of follows, right? So there's a couple of things that we notice, right? There, there must be an opening. And I think it would be suffice to say that it doesn't necessarily have to be a conscious opening. It can, in fact, be an unconscious opening. And, and maybe that, that would help benefit as well, because there are moments in our experiences where we are not necessarily conscious of where this inspiration came from, right? It just it just happened. I would call this a sort of unconscious opening. You were walking with an unconscious opening and then inspiration found and availed itself and entered. And to which now suddenly you're writing, you know, eight pages in the night, fully inspired and motivated to towards that reorientation and transformation. Now, maybe some people may be confused about why I'm saying transformation. And, and just to give, you know, example of maybe Arnold Schwarzenegger, he, he's a very, you know, when he was, well, he's still a fit guy, but you could say many people are inspired by his physical defeat, right? His physical progress and achievements. This alone can inspire somebody that maybe never worked out before. And so now they, they see him, they hear his story and what he went to and the rigor that he put himself through to achieve such physical achievements and limits. This, this can inspire someone. So, but, but see, the thing is, either this person was already looking or this person was already being consciously open to the idea of changing, right? Because I, I don't see myself being inspired by his physical defeats. I mean, I find them amazing, but I, I wouldn't find them inspiring for me to then go uh, achieve this for my own physical health. You know, not not to the degree of where he, he is in his physical, you know, fitness. Maybe it might push me just to like, yeah, I need to go to the gym, but it, it wouldn't necessarily inspire me to achieve that kind of reorientation and transformation. Now, somebody else that is sort of feels like this sense of maybe lacking, you could say, um, this lacking is already a looking, right? And so because of this looking, 
they are either unconsciously open or consciously open. And so when they encounter someone like Arnold Schwarzenegger, then they are inspired. And so then the, the journey of the transformation and re reorientation begins. But, you know, even just using all these examples, I still find, I, I still want to ask the question, where are the boundaries of inspiration? Now, remember, if I were to use this example, right, if Arnold Schwarzenegger were to die, would this person that was inspired by him still pursue the inspiration and continue the transformation, the reorientation and the transformation? I, I think at one point there's a there's a gamble on that, maybe. But I I have seen but there is cases of people being inspired to continue others people's other people's work. Right? It maybe even inspires them even more to continue like a great thinker's work or you know, anybody that had inspired them, they continue to pursue it so you know and if we just take sciences in general you could say the the sciences are just all a infinite inspiration right i mean what what pushes us towards progress if we weren't inspired for progress in the first place um, this this idea for the need of change um, nothing would have inspired us for the need of change if it weren't for things that provoked, right? There's, there's, but there's, again, the only reason why there's even debates about resistances against progress or resistances against change is it goes back to that fundamental pattern that I've noticed with inspiration, right? There's people that are, that have, that are closed off that have a resistance surrounding a specific kind of inspiration. And then there's people that walk around with sort of conscious opening or unconscious opening for inspiration to strike. Now, I think what's dangerous here is to associate inspiration with there, there seems to be a, a gap here with inspiration and then action. And I would I would dare say it's in, interpretive, right? There's interpretation involved and then action, right? So inspiration can strike someone, but then, which then follows interpretation to which they proceed with a specific action, right? Now, what's dangerous about the maybe anthropomorphic uh, center, right? The human perception of inspiration, the human center, right, of our experiences, what may be dangerous here is that maybe I am inspired to become as fit as Arnold Schwarzenegger. But then what follows afterwards becomes murky and maybe not necessarily any longer inspiration or there comes a danger of interpreting inspiration wrongly right so if i find that i'm inspired now i want to let's say i want to inspire everybody else to do this now i may get angry that nobody else is inspired by this, right? And I'm sort of shocked that nobody else wants to be like him, just like I want to be like him. And so I would say this is sort of a false interpretation of the inspiration. Or maybe inspiration is strictly individual. See, see what I'm trying to get at here is that is inspiration strictly individual or is inspiration in mass, right? Is it is inspiration supposed to be in mass or strictly particular to the individual? 
And see, that's, that's when it really, really gets messy because we can all be inspired by the same person yet interpret it in a completely different way into which the inspiration had manifested. Right? It's similar to, let's say, observing a TV in front of us. Now, if I'm sitting in a different position and you're sitting in a different position and we both observe the TV, we could say we're both inspired by the TV, by what's shown on the on the screen, but let's say your, your specific perspective, your sitting arrangement allowed you to see a specific scene more clearly than the other person's um, sitting arrangement. So, and then we could both say that we were inspired by this scene. However, inspiration gets really ambiguous here because even though we saw technically the same things, um, the person in the relative sitting arrangement maybe noticed something else that you didn't notice and vice versa. And so, and this is what, this is, this gets really messy here. And I don't want to just, I don't want to throw inspiration off and just say it's purely subjective or anything. I, I don't want to categorize, categorize inspiration as only objective or subjective. I actually just want to throw that away. What, what I'm trying to do here is actually pay attention to the pattern in which inspiration shows itself. And so what I at least can say is this, inspiration does, in fact, can, can isolate individuals and can group, right? It can isolate and group, right? So I'm going to call this separation and gathering, right? So this, at least we can say, is the general abstraction from inspiration, right? It has the capacity to separate and has the capacity to gather. And also, it can only infiltrate if there is an opening and cannot infiltrate if there is a resistance. Now, if we expand this, this, um, this general, right, this general just principles of inspiration, and we expand it to beyond the human being. So what does this mean? Well, if we just take, okay, there's gathering, and then there's division, and then there's individual, and then there's mass. Um, for example, let's just take a a um, a plant, right? A plant you could say gathers the energy, the the, the energies of the sun, right? And then transforms itself or reorientates itself to growing, right? It, it, it proceeds with a transformation to grow, right? And I, I, actually, I would, I would just strictly put that into, um, I would put that into just transformation. Now, if we take inspiration, how, how does the plant orientate itself in inspiration, right? So the plant, if there's a shade blocking it from the sun, a plant will actually extend itself out of the shade to reach the sun. So you could say this, that the plant already has an opening, right? And because it already wants to receive, it then extends itself out of the shadows to and reorientates itself to the sun. And I, and I want to be very careful about, you know, dividing these concepts mentally and trying to give up prior and after because <laughs> it gets dangerous. Uh, but I would say it's probably simultaneous that the, the reorientation and the opening is, it can possibly be simultaneous, right? Uh, it's, it's very hard to actually say you know, but again, this is just one example of nature into which you could say inspiration works, right? If we just take the general principles of the patterns of inspiration, right? That there is a gathering, 
there is resistance, there is opening, and then there is division. Now, if we take go down onto a very cellular level, you, you notice that there is division and gatherings, right? Um, for example, if you get a cut on your body, the your your body will be, begin to clot itself, right? So as a sort of healing process, it gathers, right? It gathers, and to and you also notice that when one needs to grow, right? When the cells need to replicate, they divide themselves, right? They divide themselves. Um, Now, what's, what's really interesting is if we take this gathering and the examples of the clot and healing, we, we do notice that people tend to gather in groups, right, out of inspiration to heal or remedy a situation, right? You notice that when someone falls on the street, people tend to gather, right? If a man is hurt and he's limping, people tend to gather. And, you know, also when someone is sort of attacking somebody else or provoking attacks, right? So you, so you see aggressiveness can also be a divisive separating thing. And, you know, at this point, I don't really know where I'm trying to get with that, but... Uh, just notice how, you know, teams, you have teams, right, sports, right, there's gatherings, working together. And, and I guess what I'm trying to get at here is, okay, so when inspiration covers in mass, is that better than inspiration that particularizes to the individual? Um, I'm, not, I'm not entirely sure because there can be inspiration that particularizes to the individual, which then corresponds to an inspiration of the masses. Um, so maybe maybe there's something way more complicated than what's going on here. But I do know this, right? We can at least say, and this is repetitive, of course, we can say at least the patterns of inf in inspiration reveal this, that there is an opening into which inspiration can enter, and there is a closing into which inspiration cannot enter. Um, whether that be consciously or unconsciously, or opening in terms of, you know, consciously or unconsciously. Now, and then there's gathering, and then there's, you could say, uh, dividing, right? There's, there's the gathering and dividing. And so if we take these principles even to nature, there's always... A pattern of gathering and dividing. And there's also perfect examples of sus you know, susceptibility in nature, right? And there's perfect examples of resistances in nature, right? <laughs> so what I'm doing here is almost alluding to this metaphysical pattern of inspiration to where you could argue just by having these very basic pattern principles of inspiration that, in fact, everything walks around inspired, right? Would you, you could almost argue it maybe even a, be a first cause, you know, or at least a secondary one. I'm not <laughs> again. So, yeah, enough on that. But, anyways, I hope this was interesting. I hope it gave a lot, lot to think about. I just used very general, very general principles how, and the pattern of inspiration, how it reveals itself. There's a lot of work to do here. But yeah. All right. Till next time.